on the, on the outskirts of lovely Seattle, Washington, February 5th marks the start of one of the most grueling events of its kind, the Alcan 5000. Well, this is Monday, it must be back to Earth. And back to Earth indeed, as Satch Carlson, longtime Alcan competitor and journalist, has his special Goodyear studded snow tires mounted. He's the only Alaskan entry of this year's Alcan, teaming up with husband and wife team John and Susie Faust. The Alcan 5000 rally was first held in 1984, the brainchild of organizer Jerry Hines, who wanted to introduce a new event based on the old concept of rallying as a grand tour, a motoring adventure, and a gentleman's sport. The 1990 Alcan 5000 winter rally will traverse some 6,275 miles of North America's most remote roads. Let's get Jerry's impression on this year's event. Jerry Hines, organizer of this Alcan 5000 famous or infamous rally. How difficult is it going to be, Gene, this year? We understand there are very severe temperatures, low temperatures, and also uh, a lot of wild moose around. The dangerous part and difficult part is the moose. That's a, that's a real disaster to hit one. Uh, as far as the temperatures, that's, uh, that's a plus because uh, the colder it is, the better the weather conditions are in terms of driving. Uh, if it warms up to zero or ten below, the, the, it gets cloudy, it might snow, the, it's a lot more difficult to see, particularly at night. Um, in the cold weather, it should stay pretty clear, and the snow conditions are much better traction-wise. And uh, as long as the people don't put the car in a snowbank and have to get out of the car and fix something, uh, it's ideal. Now, this uh, rally over the years has uh, got a bit of a reputation for having a gung-ho attitude. Some say it's a Sunday drive in the winter. Others take it really seriously and go for the tens of seconds it takes to win it. Got famous people here like Gene Henderson, Satch Carlson, etc., and also your ordinary Joe Blow. Mm -hmm. Well, I think everybody's taking a fairly serious attitude about it. I, I know last two years ago, we did the winter one for the first time. The first two cars we had to pull out of the ditch were Satch Carlson, who lives in Alaska, and some fellows who drove down from uh, Yellowknife in the Northwest Territories. Um, and I think that was the familiarity breeds contempt. Uh, everybody took note of that and uh, heard about it if they didn't experience it themselves, and I think there'll be a pretty conservative uh, attitude once the, uh, once the rally gets down the road. The Carlson and Faust team give us their impression of rally preparedness. Sash Carlson, famous automotive journalist, about to start another yes. Alcan 5000. Yes. How do you feel? Yes. Oh, I feel fine. We figured out how to run the CD player. We got uh, plenty of tapes, plenty of tunes. We're ready to go. Now, if we can only figure out the rally computer, we're going to be doing okay out there. This sounds like a serious attempt, then, gentlemen. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, we intend to win this rally. We've got a lot of Pepsi. We've got your Diet Pepsi. We've got your, your Hershey's with almonds. we got the proper rally equipment here. We're ready to go. It's the only Alaskan entry. We have made arrangements with the police. These people are all going to be in jail before they're five miles into the state of Alaska. Yeah, you see, we know the road. We've, we've been there before. We know we the road. Mind the road. Of course, there's only one, so it's pretty hard to get lost. But And now for a serious look. Gene Henderson driving uh, Subaru Legacy number two. You finished yeah. twice in second place in this rally. Yeah. Hopefully you're going for first place this year. Well, we've had a first in 86. We won it by one second over Ken Maytag and the Audi team. And uh, we're hoping to move up. You know, it's, uh, it should be a good event. They say the weather is uh, bad, which is, we think that's good. You know. Now, you're uh, famous, Gene, for being... Uh, one of the competitors in the original Press On Regardless rally when it was a real rally. How does that compare in some way, perhaps, to this Alcan? It's very similar. It's uh, you know, a matter of uh, endurance and uh, for the vehicle and the crew and, you know, I mean, keeping your wits together when, when things get a little bit scattered, you know. Now, we understand that it might be a serious problem with uh, wild moose on this particular event. I mean, how serious is that, Gene? Well, I mean, we're going to stop and let them have the right of way. I mean, that's uh, that's how serious it's going to be. Yeah, we're not going to. You can't win running into a moose with a with an automobile. So, they have the right of way as far as we're concerned. We just hope we can see them in time at night. That's all. Phil Berg, Everett Smith, and Jack Christensen, driving Jeep Cherokee car number one. Phil, it's your very first attempt at the Alcan 5000. How realistic do you think your chances may be of a good result? Uh, I think that's it's pretty realistic because uh, I'm a believer in voodoo and uh, that sort of thing and lots of luck. And so uh, uh, we have on our side uh, uh, naivete and innocence, whereas these other guys that have done this before are going to get too, uh, too uh, sure of themselves. And I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that's good for them, so we got a good chance. 
So at the 9.30 a.m. start, 20 competitors as well as seven official vehicles from the United States and Canada departed from the lovely Woodmark Hotel in Kirkland, Washington to begin their journey into the frozen north. This year's Alcan has a special event in store as competitors will have the opportunity to travel into the outer reaches of the Northwest Territories beyond the Arctic Circle to Inuvik. Drivers, as well as navigators, are bid farewell and good luck by friends and spectators gathered here for the early morning start. One of the first stops on the agenda for the 20 plus competitors on this event is the Canadian Customs Checkpoint on the border of Washington and beautiful British Columbia. Here we see Chris Jensen with co-driver Greg Lester, both of Ohio, in their beautiful four-wheel drive Eagle Talon TSI. This is actually part of a two-car field here for the Eagle Talons, driven by Bill Sadataki and Dave Killian. So as Chris roars away, we'll be right back with more of the Alcan 5000. The last time you subscribed to a news magazine race, but is rather a test of precision driving and endurance. Each team is given a set of instructions for the various parts of the course, and they're penalized for not following them correctly. There are two types of sections on the course, each carrying different penalties. The crucial sections are the TSDs, or time speed distance. These 20 to 30 mile sections require a precise speed that may change over a 100 yard section. Spotters are hidden throughout the TSD parts of the course and will penalize teams one point for each second too slow or too fast that they may arrive at each checkpoint. Here we see Gene Henderson with co-driver Ralph Beckman with him in the Subaru Legacy four-wheel drive wagon. They're currently in the lead and are followed closely by the Jeep Cherokee of Phil Berg, Jack Christensen and Everett Smith. Here we see the Alaskan Morons team of Satch Carlson, John Faust, and Susie Faust. And in the second of the Eagle Talon teams, Bill Sadataki with co-driver Dave Killian. Here's the $75,000 Porsche Carrera 4. It's a four-wheel drive and the only one of its kind on this event. This Ford Ranger pickup truck entered from Kitchener, Ontario is driven by Siegfried Luca. Siggy, as he's better known, has gotten most of his endurance driving skills from driving the Perry Dakar Rally over in Europe. The second of the Subaru Legacy entries, this one driven by Dave Harkham and Ken Knight from Lafayette, Indiana. This car was very special. As you can see, it was signed by all of the people who took part in building the actual machine. Mile zero on the historic Alaskan Highway and 300 kilometers left to go till the second overnight stop in Fort Nelson, British Columbia. After a good night's sleep in Fort Nelson, they will begin their first real test of reliability, equipment, and endurance in the 30-hour non-stop section to Alaska. This 30-hour section will be called a transit section. These are long stretches that help move the teams from point A to point B. The drivers are given an overall allowance for the distance, usually about 10% below the speed limit. Drivers are free to drive at their own pace throughout the section, so long as they hit the final checkpoint by the required time.
truck stops like this along the route gave drivers and navigators and sometimes some of the locals a chance to stretch their legs and grab a bite to eat. We took a few minutes out to speak to some of the competitors to get their feelings up to this point. Uh, temperature at the moment is around about minus 18, minus 20, and you've got uh, a typical rally lunch. What is it you're having there? Uh, star Kiss Chunk Light Tuna and Spring Water and Premium Saltine Crackers. So, sustenance. Oh. Like cat food. <laughs> We've got about another, what, 1,150 miles to go before we get to Anchorage. No doubt you'll be looking for a hot meal when you get there. <laughs> True enough, but we got more tuna just in case. What's that, another 18 to 20 hours? <laughs> <laughs> Half a dozen cans of tuna, you know. Hey. Gene Henderson, third day of the Alcan 5000. The longest leg. We left Fort Nelson this morning. We've got 1,300 miles to go. You're currently leading the rally. Do you think you'll be able to hold on to that? Well, we're pretty consistent. We've been up here, well, I think this is our fourth event, and uh, that's what pays off up here is consistency. And what about the Subaru Legacy? Have you had any problems at all with the car? Not a minute's trouble, no. This is our fourth year in a Subaru, and we've never had a minute. I think we had a grommet break one year or something, or something minor, you know, nothing. And what about these new Goodyear spike tires? Everybody seems to think they're absolutely wonderful. They're quite good. We, uh, we like them. Uh, what do you envisage will be any problems today, Gene, on this on this long leg? What about the moose? Have we seen any moose this morning? I haven't seen any. Uh, the problem is, uh, you know, you have to get either a one or a zero at every one of these checkpoints. Uh, historically, this event has been won by less than one second per checkpoint error. So uh, the thing is, there again, like I mentioned, it's consistency. And if you start getting twos and threes, you're going to put yourself right out of the event. And if you have something like a flat tire, or something like that, you're just kiss first place goodbye. Well, we've got a long ways to go and a lot of mileage to do. I'm going to catch you later on. Thank you. A point of interest to people from the Pacific Northwest, this bridge in British Columbia was built from the scrap and wreckage of Galloping Gertie, the old Tacoma Narrows Bridge. But competitors can't worry about whether the bridge is strong enough to hold their car. They're hoping that their cars are strong enough to hold them for the next 1,300 miles till they can make it to their overnight stop and free day in Anchorage, Alaska. And we'll be right back with more of the Alcan 5000 Winter Rally in just a moment. Let's take a few minutes to see some of the beautiful sights of Northern British Columbia, the Yukon, and onward into Alaska to Anchorage.
day nine. And competitors are just outside of Anchorage, Alaska. They get their first stop at the Long Rifle Lodge so they can have some breakfast and a quick cup of coffee before they go in for their much-deserved break and rest halt and day off in Anchorage. Inside the Long Rifle Lodge are quite a few interesting things that you can take a look at as you get to eat right next to a bear. Satch Carlson with John and Susie Fausch at the wheel, having had a few problems with fuel on the long trip, were moving along just fine. This Eagle Talon was privately entered by Brian Davitt of Wisconsin. With co-driver Adrian Crane, they were sitting just outside the top 10 at the halfway point. Competitors will have a two-day break in Anchorage to take part in one of the top 10 festivals in the United States, the historic Anchorage Fur Rendezvous. We took a few minutes to get out and sample some of the sights and sounds that Anchorage has to offer in this great festival. Part of the Fur Rendezvous experience has to be the annual ice races held just outside of the Anchorage International Airport. Cars and drivers will take part on this tight and twisty course. But one of the fun things about it is it has very natural barricades made up of snow. All sorts of vehicles are entered. All different makes and all different kinds and of course all different drivers. One of the celebrity drivers in attendance was Parnelli Jones' son, P.J. Jones. P.J. Jones, son of Parnelli Jones, you've been in Australia r racing midgets, you're up here in Alaska, why? Well, basically just to have fun, uh, you know, I got talked to this deal by Dennis Oss, he said come up, we'll have a great time, do a little ice racing up here through the streets of uh, Alaska here, and it, it's a good time. 
Now, are you going to take this seriously, or I mean, everybody seems to be having a lot of fun, but I mean, once you're in the car, it's serious time and it's real racing. Yeah, I think anytime you know you get in a race car, it's pretty much serious, a serious uh, deal. But uh, it's a lot of fun. Everybody has a lot of fun doing this, but they're real serious about it. Real serious about it, indeed. This competition was very close over those two days. The competition was fun, though, and all the people involved had a great time. On the second and last day in Anchorage, the competitors of the Alcan 5000 had a chance to take a victory lap around the circuit. Here we see Satch Carlson, followed by the Subaru entry of Harkin the Knight. This Subaru entry, driven by Art Isler and Ed Botwick. The truck of Mike Rouge and Siggy. The privately entered Eagle Talon. The factory Eagle Talon of Bill Sadataki. The Porsche Carrera 4 of Tim Patterson and Don Gibson, both of Washington. The number 10 big Ford Bronco of Lou DeLong and Tom Grimshaw. The other Eagle Talon of Chris Jensen. And the number 20 Chevy Blazer from North Carolina, driven by Shad Bosher, Bill Gladden, and Ron Mason. And of course, our trusty old Audi Quattro camera car. As we say goodbye to Anchorage, Alaska, and the beautiful Fur Rendezvous Festivals, competitors begin their second of the longest legs of this trip, a 24-hour trip to Dawson City and Eagle Plains before heading up north beyond the Arctic Circle. Unfortunately, the trip north won't be an easy one, as competitors will have to put up with temperatures as low as 70 below zero before reaching the infamous Dempster Highway and another 300-plus miles of empty, desolate road before reaching Eagle Plains. Stay tuned for more of the Alcan 5000 Winter Rally. We'll be right back. To the average car, this could be a dangerous body. and grades and how well the tires hold on corners and so on of that nature. Um, as far as the, the time, speed, and distance is concerned, we are generally... ...weighs one millionth of an ounce, yet it can take a 2,000-pound car and blow it right off the road. That's why you should drive the new four-wheel drive Subaru Legacy. Think of it as a five-passenger snowmobile. Welcome back. We took some time out to talk to Jack Christensen, co-driver for Phil Berg in the Jeep, and also designer of the new TimeWise Rally computer. Jack Christensen, the Alcan 5000 is a time, speed, and distance event. What exactly is a time, speed, and distance event? Perhaps you can explain to us. Well, generally, uh, it's like the ultimate, ultimate driver's test that everybody has to take. Uh, we're trying to determine whether or not we can very precisely drive a particular course following a very, very exact set of instructions at very precise speeds. The, the idea of time, speed, or distance is that they're all interrelated, as we've all learned at one time or another. And by driving a particular course over an exacting distance at what are given speeds, uh, generally about 5 or 10 miles below the speed limit, uh, we can arrive at any particular point along the way anytime we need to. Uh, it's kind of like when uh, the children always used to ask, are we there yet, Daddy? Well, that's kind of a continuous thing that goes on yet. There's a, an interplay that goes along between uh, two or three people in a car, uh, the actual automobile itself and the tires and how well it performs on hills and grades and how well the tires hold on corners and so on of that nature. Um, as far as the, the time, speed, and distance is concerned, we are generally given a distance to drive and a very, very precise course. We have to drive that particular course at a particular speed, hoping that we can arrive at every particular point along there exactly when we are expected to. Now, over a period of years, the calculations that were done by hand have become very, very quick. And we have used handheld calculators, we've used particular mechanical computers, and it's gotten to the point that the mileage measurement became very, very critical. No longer were we interested in miles, or for that matter, even tenths of a mile that are typically in most automobiles, but we're, me we're measuring in actual hundredths of miles, and in fact, our resolution is to the hundred millionth of a mile. So, for a number of reasons, we have to have some sort of mechanics to allow us to measure that precisely. Well, now, I understand, uh, as you say, some sort of mechanics has resulted in a very sophisticated onboard computer 
uh, available to the navigator uh, on these events. Perhaps you can explain how that works. Sure. Uh, in order to handle all this very highly precise driving and navigational needs, we have developed a number of machines that will help us measure very, very precise mileage. In fact, the precision is such that we are working with distances as, I would say, as small as like a, like a hundredth of an inch. Uh, we can accommodate for variations in tire temperature, variations in the way that the driver navigates a corner, uh, cold, hot, altitude, things of that nature. Now the idea is that if we measure very, very precise distances and we know the speed at which we're supposed to go, we can do kind of a backwards calculation and find out how long it should take us to get to wherever we go. The computer basically does it for us over and over and over again. We drive 10 feet, it says, well, if you were to drive 30 miles an hour, it should take you such and such time to drive 10 feet at 30 miles an hour. It redoes this every single foot. And the idea being that we know that every time we move down the course, we are getting there at a particular time. The computer really perhaps should be called a mileage measuring device and a very, very precise clock. In fact, we happen to measure to seconds, which means that after driving 500 miles, we actually know that we should have arrived after a 500-mile trip exactly at a particular moment in time. We'll be speaking to Jack Christensen later on in the program to get more information on what TSD rallying is really all about. As we follow competitors long into the night, on their 26-hour journey to Dawson City and beyond to the Arctic Circle. We caught up with several of the competitors before they made their stop at the Canadian Alaskan Customs Post. We had a chance to talk to Tom Grimshaw, Lou DeLong's co-driver, about how the event has gone so far. If you hear the temperature, uh, no, what, what is the temperature? Four point three below and dropping. And dropping? Yeah, back at the Customs thing. How, uh, how low do you think it'll get this evening? 50. About 50 below the. Before we get up to, before we get up to Eagle Plains, 50. But the two years ago when we were at it was 55. That's the low, lowest we got. 55. And how, how does that affect the equipment? Uh, all of this electric, uh, electronic qu equipment here that you have, of course, in order to uh, meet the. We just don't shut the car off. Just let it keep running. As long as you keep the heat here, it doesn't affect it at all. Sunshine falls on the competitors as they reach the Dempster Highway and famed Tombstone Mountain. Here we see the number eight Suzuki sidekick of George Gibbons from Mission, British Columbia, and Dan Goodwin of Atlanta, Georgia. George Gibbons was refueling his Suzuki as it was only getting about eight miles to the gallon. The Dempster Highway is a cold and desolate place with hundreds of miles of absolutely frozen road. As this was a transit section, it allowed drivers to really let the cars open up. Here we see Bill Sadataki wasting no time putting the Eagle Talon through its paces. And here's the Ford Bronco of Lou DeLong and Tom Grimshaw not wasting any time either. The Ford Ranger truck with Siegfried Luca and Michael Rouge, both from Kitchener, Ontario, getting the truck a little sideways as they go by. Here's the Moron team from Alaska with Satch Carlson and his partners at crime at the wheel. Here's the Jeep Cherokee driven by Phil Berg from Ann Arbor, Michigan with Jack Christensen reading the notes and Everett Smith taking a nice nap in back. And there's Chris Jensen in the other Eagle Talon TSI. As you can see, it's a very cold and desolate place up here on the Dempster Highway. Not the kind of place that you'd want to have any sort of car troubles. But the Eagle Talon, driven by Chris Jensen and co-driver Gregory Lester, shows that with the right combination of four-wheel drive and the turbocharged engine, you can go just about anywhere. It's probably a little known fact that the dumpster highway is quite often used for cold weather testing by most manufacturers. And if your passenger car can make it through these sort of conditions, it can make it through just about anything. As our trusty Audi 5000 Quattro trundles on towards Eagle Plains, we'll be right back in just a moment with more of the Alcan 5000 winter round. This Quiet, cold beauty of the Northwest Territories is absolutely breathtaking.
competitors were in awe of the scenery at every turn. But the scenery was not without its dangers, as there was some 20,000 head of roaming and ranging caribou out on the Dempster Highway. Upon arriving at the Eagle Plains Hotel, competitors had another chance to relax and unwind before another long day which would take them some 200 miles north of the Arctic Circle. Beautiful sunsets greeted competitors each night as they made their way in. But it was sunsets such as this that really grasped the imagination of all that attended. Chris Jensen and Bill Sadataki doing some last minute planning before tomorrow's long trip. And Phil Berg bringing the Jeep home, now closer to a first place. And the Arctic Circle, an early morning start for the competitors as they pass by this historic landmark each of them gaining their own little place in history and taking a bit of history home with them. Although this wasn't the first accident to take hold of one of the vehicles during the event, Lou DeLong got a little bit wrong in his excitement to reach the Arctic Circle tagged the back of Satch Carlson's Mazda, putting his truck right off of the road. But friendly people and friendly crews were able to extract him, and they were back on the road, the road to Inuvik. As competitors traveled north, we decided to take a trip into the historic gold rush town of Dawson City, made famous for the Klondike Gold Rush of 1898. Let's take a trip through and take a look at some of the sights, Dawson City. Although much of Dawson City is closed down during the winter months, it's still a beautiful town. And while we were in Dawson City, we caught up again with Jack Christensen to get some more information on what it's like to co-drive. Is it a complex piece of equipment to operate? And from what you say, uh, a, a time, speed and distance stage can be won or lost on the skills of the operator as much as on the skills of the driver. Yeah, I would say that that's generally the case. In fact, it's a very much of a team, not only between the two men or three men that are in the car, uh, but also with the machines themselves, or the, the actual uh, car itself. Uh, all the roles are very important. Uh, the car has to hold together, particularly in an event such as this nature. I mean, the difficulties of the environment are very, very much. Uh, the tires are very important. We need to also have generally a four-wheel drive vehicle, just so we don't have any tire slippage. The navigator's skills very often have to do with a little bit of guessing. Uh, feeling for what's happening so you're kind of although you're not really driving the vehicle you do have to have a feel for are we drifting are we sliding uh, is there a problem with the tire spin are we braking too hard and is there locking up the wheels uh, so that part of it as far as the navigator is concerned uh, it requires him to make some judgments and the computer allows him to on the fly make those judgments and correct as necessary uh, the navigator very often is just saying to the driver, don't worry about the numbers, what I'm doing is correct, I'm in my office, you do what you have to do, I do what I have to do. And a little communication goes back and forth and that's how it generally works. The grand and majestic Fraser River, frozen solid for the winter, its snaking body silent in the crisp winter air. Phil Bird, on his first Alcan, was putting on an impressive show of driving skills. Only a handful of points was separating the first five places. At one point, Phil Berg was even leading on the event, but a simple mistake cost him a few points and dropped him back out of first place. He was dropped out of first place by this man, the ever-consistent Gene Henderson. Gene was driving the four-wheel drive Subaru Legacy, and not having won this event since 1986, he had the bit in his teeth and he wasn't about to be beaten. Susie Faust, now driving for 
Satch Carlson and the Morons team is about to have a close encounter of the worst kind. But they managed to collect the car up and get the car underway. But that might cost them some valuable seconds. Here's the private entry, the Eagle Talon of Brian Davitt and Adrian Crane, motoring along well on these snowy, icy stages. Putting the car just a little sideways and possibly taking a few penalty points in the process, but it's all in the name of fun, and fun this event is. Here's the factory Eagle Talon entry of Bill Sadataki and Dave Killian. The Eagle Talon not giving him any problems at all, firm grip from the tires and excellent traction from the four-wheel drive. With driving like this and an excellent co-driver, Bill was keeping himself right up inside the top five. Not exactly the type of car most people would take out on a snow-filled 6,275-mile road race. Tim Patterson and Don Gibson from Renton, Washington in the Porsche Carrera 4. This is a four-wheel drive, turbocharged Porsche. Very rare and worth about $75,000. Here's the Suzuki sidekick, driven by George Gibbons, co-driven by Dan Goodwin, getting a little sideways there, but managing to keep the little Suzuki under control and inside the top 10. The second of the Eagle TSI Talon teams, this, driven by Chris Jensen and Gregory Lester. Both of these competitors organized the Eagle team and flew out from Ohio to take part in this year's event. Here's the big Ford Bronco of Blue DeLong, and Tom Grimshaw, their bumper just a little twisted off of the back of the truck, but still pressing on. Here's the Ford Ranger of Michael Rouge and Siegfried Luca. They're running without studs on this event, which makes it a little tricky to get around these icy hairpin bends. The second of the Subaru Legacy team, the entry of Dave Harkham and Ken Knight, pushing on well and keeping themselves right up close next to their teammate, Gene Henderson. And here's our friends from North Carolina again. They had a bit of a scary moment on the first night of the rally, having rolled their big Chevy Blazer on a corner. They were unable to get studded tires for their Blazer until they reached Anchorage, which gave them a few scary moments, but they managed to work it out all right. close as competitors were heading south for the final days of the event and the long-awaited finish in Harrison Hot Springs, British Columbia. Gene Henderson was still in the lead, but that place was being hotly contested by the two Eagle Talons, Chris Jensen and Bill Sadataki. To the average car, this could be a dangerous body of water. Days one million. As the 1990 Alcan 5000 Winter Rally drew to a close, Gene Henderson knew that he had a win in sight. But some problems on this first morning stage of the last day threw competitors into a frenzy. There was a mileage marker that was done wrong in the route book, and everybody was off. And then to compound matters, five of the competitors got stuck behind a snowplow for over ten minutes, could not get around him, and lost valuable seconds. Each of these stages had to be thrown out. Much to the dismay of the people that were running closely up there and needed those valuable points. This nearly ensured Gene Henderson the win on this 1990 Alcan 5000. One of the stranger sights on this event, the number eight Suzuki sidekick of George Gibbons passing the $75,000 Porsche Carrera 4. This was quite a sight considering the Suzuki is down two cylinders on the Porsche and it's also down a considerable amount of horsepower. But the Porsche is pushing on and I'm sure he was gonna catch that Suzuki one way or another. 
Chris Jensen in the Eagle Talon was putting on an incredible show, but despite his valiant effort, he was some 15 seconds off the lead of Gene Henderson. So as we watch Lou DeLong and Tom Grimshaw head on into service, we catch up with Bill Sadataki to find out what happened. There was a little cock up with the mileage and uh, uh, I'm trying to get some of the cars got stacked up and it's the exciting part of TSD rallying. It's really not fun when you're on course, but when you get off course, it's very interesting. Has it thrown you at all? No, we, we were fine. We were on course. In fact, our mileage was better there than it has been the whole event. But the uh, number four car got, got uh, back in our minute, so we had to... So you got this last TSD to do now? Yeah, we got one more stage, and then we're, I guess, into the finish. And uh, if we keep it together, you know, maybe somebody else will fall off the road. Can you improve your position, or are you just going to hold on? We can... Uh, Somebody else is going to have to have a problem. You know, we, there's not enough rallying left for us to creep up on somebody incrementally. Um, but if we run clean and somebody else has a problem, we can move up. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Gene. Good morning. Now, a little bit of a mix-up with that last TSD, but uh, you managed to get through okay. What, what was the problem? Not okay. There was a mileage uh, turn that was off a mile, and it sort of scattered the rally around a little bit. But... We've been in contact with Jerry. I guess he's going to throw it from there on out, that particular portion. So, so that hasn't, no effect, hasn't affected your position so far? I don't think it affects anything. Okay. No. Well, you're in the lead and one TSD to go. Feel confident, gentlemen? Yeah, we, we're happy. Okay, well, uh, it's not over till it's over, is it? That's right. That's right. Okay, thank you. But for the most part, it was over for the rest of the competitors as Gene Henderson and his trusty co-driver, Ralph Beckman, put the Subaru Legacy four-wheel drive through its paces. Gene was definitely by far the class of the field, managing just to stay out of reach of the rest of the competitors. Gene managed to finish the event with an incredible 41 seconds of penalty points. That's 41 seconds over 6,275 miles. An impressive victory indeed. But just as impressive were his teammates in the other Subaru Legacy wagon of Dave Harkham and Ken Knight. Dave Harkham and Ken Knight finished a scant six seconds behind Gene Henderson after 6,275 miles, six penalty points separating the top two finishers, with a total of 22 seconds or 22 penalty points separating the top five. The Subarus were literally indestructible. The only problem on the entire event, when Gene Henderson lost an oil pump due to the extreme cold. But once he got the new oil pump on and was underway, he managed to come back and win the event. So out of 20 cars starting out of Seattle, 19 cars would finish in Harrison Hot Springs, British Columbia after 6,275 miles of racing. First place was the Subaru Legacy of Gene Henderson. Second place was the Subaru Legacy of David Harkham. Third place was the Eagle Talon of Bill Sadataki. Fourth place was the Jeep Cherokee Limited of Phil Berg, also first in truck class. Fifth place was the other Eagle Talon of Chris Jensen. Sixth place was the Suzuki Sidekick of George Gibbons. Isler and Bowick were seventh. Satch Carlson was eighth. The Davit privately entered Eagle Talon was ninth. And the Ford Bronco of DeLong and Grimshaw were tenth. We took a few minutes to talk to the winners, Gene Henderson and Ralph Beckman of the Subaru Legacy. Ralph Beckman, Gene Henderson here at the end of the Arkane 5000 Rally. Possibly the winners. How do you feel about it? Great. It was a good event, very challenging, and we enjoyed it. it got to be a little long at the end, but uh, we're glad it's over. Now, I see you're possibly the winners. There's been a bit of a problem this morning on some of the TSDs. Uh, from a navigational point of view, what was that? Well, there was uh, a missed route direction that forced uh, the first five or six cars, I guess, to be running around looking for the right road. But I believe that that portion of the route has been thrown out. And then on the second TSD, there was a snowplow that uh, absolutely stopped the first five cars, and it's not clear whether there were any checkpoints after that and uh, if there were any points taken. But uh, we'll see. Has it been particularly difficult, Ralph, navigating this particular outcome? Well, I don't think any particular point of it is difficult. The difficult part is not making a single mistake over the 10 days of the events because there's periods of uh, great excitement and then boredom and uh, the idea is you just can't make one mistake. You make one mistake, that's that's it. The, the winner of this rally will not make a mistake. Gene, I'll come back to you now. You've had this Subaru Legacy. You've taken it right up 
into the Arctic Circle. Overall, how's the car performed? You had a little bit of a problem one day, but apart from that? It's been great. Uh, we've uh, had no problems uh, other than that's that little blitz the first uh, or second day, but uh, it's performed well. It hasn't let us down, and we're happy with it. Bill Sarataki and Dave Killian here at the end of the 1990 Alcan 6500, I think we should call it, a very grueling event. Yeah, it was a very difficult event, uh, although we had a good time. We got what we came for, which is a lot of tremendous driving on some good roads. Um, the car's been great. Tires, you know, from Michelin are great. Um, the most interesting thing for us is that the, uh, the actual scoring takes place on the slowest part of the event, and, um, you know, we had a few problems measuring, but uh, overall we had a good time. Everything went well. Did you have any opportunity to uh, cut loose with the car and, uh, you know, get some... Uh some of the performance out of it on these roads? Oh, yeah. We had a lot of opportunities to run the cars the way they're supposed to be run. Um, everything worked great. Uh, the, the long transits were really, really fun. Uh, unlike 88, uh, there wasn't as much heavy truck traffic, so we had uh, chances to open the cars up for longer stretches and uh, enjoy them a little bit. How far you've walked today? Do you know how far you've run? What was your average speed? How many calories you've